This next reading focuses on probability, so let's begin with some key terms. A random variable is an uncertain number, so if you roll a die, the number that it will land on is a random variable because you don't know what number it will be. An outcome is the actual observed value. If you end up rolling a 2, that was the outcome. An event is one or more outcomes. For example, rolling a 3 is an event, and rolling an even number is an event as well. Mutually exclusive events can't happen at the same time. It either rains or it doesn't rain, so the probability that they both happen is basically zero. And finally, Exhaustive events include all possible outcomes. It either rains or it doesn't. There is no third possible outcome. Let's assume that the chance of rain is 70% and the chance of no rain is 30%. Does this comply with the two defining properties of probabilities? The probability of each event falls between 0 and 1, so it complies with the first defining property. And since events are both mutually exclusive and exhaustive, their probabilities must add up to 1. So, it also complies with the second defining property. You should also be able to differentiate between the following types of probabilities. Empirical probabilities are found by analyzing past data. A priori probabilities require a reasoning process. And subjective probabilities are just personal opinions. And don't forget that both empirical and a priori probabilities are objective probabilities. This next learning outcome compares odds with probability. Let's say that the odds of your team winning are 4 to 1. What is the probability of a win? This is the formula to convert odds to probability. The probability of winning in this case is 80%. Notice that the probability of loss would be 1 minus the probability of winning, which equals 20%. An unconditional probability is the probability of an event happening, and it is not affected by any past events. For example, if you flip a coin, it doesn't matter how many heads or tails you've gotten in the past. The probability of heads or tails will always be the same. On the other hand, conditional probabilities depend on past events. They are written as the probability of A given B. For example, the probability that you bring an umbrella, given that it's raining, is 70%, or the probability of bringing an umbrella, given that it's not raining, is 30%. Clearly, the probability of A depends on whether it rains or it doesn't. Now, let's actually calculate some probabilities using the following probability rules. The multiplication rule, or joint probability rule, tells you the probability of A and B. The addition rule gives the probability of A or B. Let's look at each of them individually to make them easier to remember. In this example, we are given the probability of rain, which is 70%, and the probability of bringing an umbrella, given that it rains, which is 90%. To find the joint probability that it rains and you bring an umbrella, you can use the multiplication rule. Let's plug in the correct values so the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B. A quick reminder about the multiplication formula is that if events A and B are independent, then the formula can be simplified in this way. Why? because A is independent of B, so the probability of A, given that B occurred, is just the probability of A alone. To remember the addition rule, you can think of a Venn diagram. The probability of A or B is found by adding the probability of A and the probability of B and taking away the probability of A and B. You should also be familiar with one more rule, called the total probability rule. It looks complicated at first, but it simply states that the probability of A is the sum of all the joint probabilities that include A. The easiest way to understand the total probability rule is to draw a tree diagram. Let's look at the economy as an example. 
assume that the probability of an economic boom is 30%, a neutral economy is 50%, and an economic downturn is 20%. Notice that the events are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. In each of these three scenarios, people could either be happy or upset. But to keep things simple, let's only focus on the happy branches for now. These are your conditional probabilities. The probability of having a happy population given an economic boom is 90%. A happy population given a neutral economy is 50%. And a happy population given a downturn is 10%. What is the joint probability of an economic boom and a happy population? You can use the multiplication rule, which states that the probability of A and B is simply the probability of A given B times the probability of B. If you don't remember the formula, just multiply across the branch to get the joint probability. Now let's calculate the joint probability of a neutral economy and a happy population, as well as the joint probability of a downturn and a happy population. Now, let me ask you this. What is the probability that our population will be happy? Well, this is where the total probability rule comes in. Remember that it is the sum of all of the joint probabilities that include a happy population. So the answer should be 54%. That's why tree diagrams are useful. If you can draw a tree diagram, you can pretty much solve any probability problem without using formulas. Here is the total probability formula again. And here are the values from the tree diagram plugged in so that you can confirm that the total probability rule is simply the sum of the joint probabilities. Expected values are basically the probability weighted average of possible outcomes. So for example, if there is a 40% chance that you'll make $100 and a 60% chance that you'll make $20, just multiply each outcome by its corresponding probability to get the expected value. In this case, the expected value is equal to a $52 profit. You should also know how to calculate the variance using probabilities. It is the expected value of the square deviations from the expected value. But if that's confusing, let's just jump straight into an example. Assume that the economy can be either good, neutral, or bad, and these are the probabilities of each outcome, as well as the inflows that you receive in each case. The first step is to calculate the expected value. Remember that it is the probability weighted average of the inflows. It should be equal to 34. Next, to calculate the variance, you need to use the following formula. Pause the video if you want to work through the actual calculations, but you should know that you can actually use the calculator instead. Using your calculator, first you must access the data function and enter the inflows as x values and the probabilities as y values. But be careful, the probabilities must be entered as whole numbers, not decimals. Next, you need to access the stat function and you'll see that everything has been calculated for you. You should see n equals 100 if you entered the probabilities correctly. The expected value is 34. The standard deviation is 17.44, and the variance can be found by squaring the standard deviation. Now let's introduce the topic of covariance, which is used to measure how two variables move together. If stock A increases when stock B increases, or it falls when stock B falls, then they have a positive covariance. If they move in opposite directions, then they have a negative covariance. The problem with covariance is that it is hard to interpret because it can range from negative infinity to positive infinity. That's why many analysts use correlation instead, because it measures how two variables move together, but it is scaled so that it always stays between negative 1 and positive 1. If two stocks have a correlation of negative 1, it is a perfect negative correlation, meaning that if one stock increases by 1%, the other stock will fall by the same amount. A correlation of positive 1 means the stocks move in the same direction, 
and by the same amount. Zero just means that there's no correlation between the stocks. You should be familiar with the following formula. Correlation between X and Y is equal to their covariance divided by the standard deviations of each. So be very careful if the problem gives you variances instead of standard deviations. This is a key formula to calculate covariance. But what happens if you're given a series of historical values and you're asked to calculate the covariance? For example, assume you are given that historical monthly returns for stocks X and Y, and you are asked to find the covariance between them. Well, you can either use this very long covariance formula, or you can just use your calculator. To use your calculator, first enter the X's as well as the Y's into the data function in the calculator. Once those values have been entered, you're going to access the stat function. Within the stat function, just keep clicking the down arrow, and you'll see that the calculator has automatically calculated the standard deviations for a population and a sample, as well as the correlation coefficient. But what about the covariance? If you remember the formula from before, you'll know that you can plug in your standard deviations and correlation coefficient in order to solve for the covariance. Now that you understand these concepts, let's shift the focus to portfolio returns and variance. Take a look at this portfolio, with 30% invested in stock A and 70% invested in stock B. You are also given each security's standard deviation, their expected returns, and correlation coefficient. The portfolio's expected value is simply the weighted average of the returns. Next, let's calculate the portfolio variance. All you have to do is plug in the numbers into this very long formula, so pause the video and check your work. Here are the values plugged in. And be extra careful with the last component. The covariance was not given, but you can find it by multiplying the correlation by the standard deviations. You should also pay attention if a test question asks you for portfolio standard deviation. We just calculated the variance, so take its square root to find the standard deviation. Earlier in this reading, we calculated covariances using historical values, but how do you calculate covariance when there are probabilities involved? Let's look at an example. There is a 20% chance of having a good economic cycle, 50% chance of a neutral one, and 30% chance of a bad one. Here are the expected returns for stock A under each scenario, and for stock B in each scenario. What is the covariance between stocks A and B? The first step is to find the expected return for stock A. Notice that it's just the weighted average of its returns. The next step is to find the expected return for stock B which is also the weighted average of its returns. Now that you have the expected values, you will need the following covariance formula. Pause the video to plug in the values and then check your work. Here is the answer for the covariance as well as the calculation. The next learning outcome covers Bayes' theorem, which is used to update old probabilities when new information is given. We highly recommend that you draw a tree diagram with the given information to avoid making mistakes. Let's look at an example. Here we have the probability that it rains and the probability of no rain. The probability that someone brings an umbrella, given that it rained, is 80%. The probability that they didn't bring one, given that it rained, is 20%. The chance of bringing an umbrella, given no rain, is 5% and not bringing one is 95%. To get the joint probabilities, remember that you can simply multiply across each branch. What is the updated probability that it rained, given that the person brought an umbrella? You will not find this probability anywhere on the tree diagram. You have to use Bayes' theorem to update the probability of rain because there is new information stating that they brought an umbrella. Bayes' theorem uses the joint probabilities to create a ratio, so let's compute that ratio. The new information is that they brought an umbrella, 
so all the outcomes where they brought an umbrella go in the ratio's denominator. Out of this group of outcomes, which include an umbrella, the one where it rained, becomes the numerator. So the updated probability of rain, given that they brought an umbrella, is now 96%. This is a huge change from the initial probability of rain, which was only 60%. The last part of the reading covers counting principles. You should know these five formulas, as well as when to use each one. Let's go over them individually. The multiplication rule is used when you have many tasks, and each individual task can be done in a given number of ways. Ice cream is a good example. Suppose that making an ice cream takes three steps. Step one has three cup sizes, step two has four flavors, and step three has five toppings to choose from, but you can only pick one of each. Using the multiplication rule, you get 60 possible ways to complete these three tasks. Factorial is used when you are ordering a set of items. For example, assigning five people into five different slots. You have five people to choose from for the first slot. Once you select the first person, you only have four people left to choose from for the second spot, and so on. That's what five factorial means. There are 120 ways to arrange these five people. Next we have labeling, which is used when arranging items into subgroups of a specific size. For example, you have nine students, and you must place two into the first group, three in another group, and four in the last group. Using the labeling formula, there are 1,260 ways to arrange the students into these subgroups. Moving on to combinations. Here you should look out for the word choose or combination. And remember that when you're selecting items, the order does not matter in a combination. For example, in how many ways can you choose three cards from a set of 10 if the order you select them in does not matter? This is the notation, which means you have 10 cards and must choose three. Remember that you can use your calculator to save time instead of using the formula. Here are the calculator keystrokes as well as the answer so that you can check your work. And finally, in a permutation, the order in which you select things is important. For example, in how many ways can you select three cards from a group of 10 when order matters? Use the permutation button in the calculator to save time. Here is the notation, which means you have 10 cards and you must pick three. Here are the calculator keystrokes so that you can check your work. You've made it to the end of this reading. Excellent work. For more videos like these, go to wallstreetnotes.com and master the entire CFA curriculum by watching simple animated videos.